Krishna. <laughs> okay. So I'm only sitting here by the order of Radhana Swami, so <laughs> I beg your I beg your mercy that somehow by obeying his order I may be able to offer something of some value to give some hope in your hearts for Krishna consciousness. Reading, continuing the ecstatic narration in the tenth canto, Lord Brahma stealing the boys and the calves. The thirteenth chapter, text thirty-four, first word by word and translation. Taka thereafter, Pravasya elderly. Nirupa, cowherd men, took a slave, Sunirita, became overjoyed by embracing their sons. Kristrat, with difficulty. Sunahi, gradually. Apagata, ceased from that embracing and returned to the forest. Tat Anusmriti Udasrava As they remember their sons, tears began to roll down from their eyes. Tata Pravasya Sogopas Tata pravasya sogopas. Tata pravaya sogopas. Tata pravaya sogopas. Tata shlesha sunirvita. Tata shlesha sunirvita. Kishakshane Rapagatas Kishakshane Rapagatas Kishakshane Rapagatas Kishakshane Rapagatas Kishakshane Rapagatas Kishakshane Tarana Smriti Udasrava Tata Pravyasya Sogopas Tata Pravyasya Sogopas Tata Smriti Udasrava Tata Pravasya Sogopas Tata Pravasya Sogopas Tata Pravasya Sogopas
Ladies, Translation. Thereafter, the elderly cowherd men, having obtained great feeling from embracing their sons, gradually and with great difficulty and reluctance, ceased embracing them and returned to the forest. But as the men remembered their sons, tears began to roll down from their eyes. Purport. In the beginning, the cowherd men were angry that the cows were being attracted by the calves. But when the men came down from the hill, they themselves were attracted by their sons, and therefore the men began to embrace them. To embrace one's son and smell his head are symptoms of affection. Om Ajnana Miranda Syalana Nan Sakaya Chaksuni Tamjana Sasme Sivari Namaha Sri Krishna Shaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Sri Advaita Vedadhar Sri Vasudhi Gaurakta Vinda Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare, Om Chakalpa Tuvyascha, Kripa Sindhu Vedyascha, Vatita Nam Pavandiyo Vaishnavedya Namo Namaha. So this um, purport is two sentences, and the sentences combined are expressing the affection that was felt by the cowherd men upon seeing their sons. It was, at first, they were angry when they saw the cows were running off to their calves and nuzzling the calves and licking the calves and allowing the calves to suckle the milk. So they were coming down after the calves from the hill. But then they saw their own sons. And when they saw their own sons, the natural affection between father and son was awakened. And then they, be, they became attracted to their sons, just like the cows had become atta- attracted to their calves. And then, as a result of that spontaneous attraction, then the men embraced their sons. And then, after embracing them, they began to smell the heads of their sons. I think this is probably something only a parent can relate to. Um, 
but it's expre expressed here by Srila Prabhupada that to embrace one's son and to smell the head of one's son, these are symptoms of affection. So then I was thinking that the purport of this verse is about affection. It's that um, different types of affection one feels and the different <coughs> reaction one feels according to the object of the affection. So I was looking through Prabhupada's various words on this topic and from the science of self-realization there is a very nice passage um, dealing with affection. So it's expressed there by Srila Prabhupada how the spiritual varieties are merely reflected in this material world. So just like we have the example of the tree then it's reflected into a river or a lake of water but the tree is reflected upside down and we can then understand from this simple example how the material world is a reflection of the spiritual world but it is a perverted reflection and sometimes the reflection can be very enchanting it can almost become somewhat bewildering like where does the reflection, where does the real tree end and where does the reflection begin? At this time of the year in New Vrindavan, it is autumn season. So during the transition from summertime to autumn, the leaves start changing their color. And there is a symphony of, of colors. There's a big festival of colors all the trees are going through according to the type of tree is going through a different translation transition so some trees are multicolored the lower branches are still somewhat green and then they get a little yellow and then a little orange and then a dark red but not a dull dark red it's like a real um, very vibrant dark red and other trees are completely ecstatically red and other trees are ecstatically orange <coughs> and other trees are shimmering yellow <coughs> and all of this is mixed together and when you see the um, hillside of trees then you, you don't you it's hard to focus on any one one any one tree because you just each one is just looking so wonderful and the whole picture is so colorful then when that same um, situation is nearby a water like we have these ponds of um, if you've been to New Vrindavan you've seen we have these ponds these lakes so then in the lake the whole thing is being reflected and sometimes you can't see where the reflection begins and where the real forest is standing they have merged so then there's this great panorama of dancing colors so then it's a little bewildering. So in the same way in the material world we become bewildered by these perverted, refre perverted reflections. So in this world we're finding that there's love between mother and son, love between wife and husband, love between master and servant, between friend and friend, and between master, the dog, the cat, or even the cow. But these, these feelings of love that we're experiencing in this world are only reflections of the spiritual world. So Krishna is also the lover of animals, the calves and the cows. So just as here we're loving dogs and cats, Krishna loves cows and calves. So the propensity to love even an animal is there in the spiritual world. Otherwise, we wouldn't have that same propensity here in the material world. But this is simply a reflection. It's, if there's nothing like that, Prabhupada puts, if there's nothing like that in the spiritual reality, how can it be reflected here? 
the reflection is depending upon the existence of something. So to understand the original propensity to love, then you have to practice Krishna consciousness. So in this world, we are experiencing frustration. Radhanath Maharaj was very vividly expressing the different frustrations of this world yesterday. And this frustration is coming from an attempt to love. Here we love. Man loves woman, or woman loves man. But love, which should be bringing great joy and happiness in the material world, results in frustration. Because why? The love is perverted reflection. So, actually, Prabhupada states succinctly, there is no love in this world. That was actually, for me, the first clear les lesson that I heard and learned from Srila Prabhupada upon my first meeting with him in San Francisco in 1967, that he was glancing at a, our little temple was kind of small, and it was completely full house, and he looked at the mixture of people, many of them who were young hippie boys and girls. And the hippie culture was based on love and peace. That was their hope, their desire, love and peace. So Srila Prabhupada looks at this cr the surrounding crowd and he starts out by saying, there is no love in the material world. So this was a cold, stark fact. It could have been like cold water in the face. But then he very eloquently began to describe the nature and the origin of pure love. And in doing so, he was gaining our love and affection as he was giving his to us. So the loving propensity is so expansive. The Prabhupada said even by loving the whole human society, you know, some people, they want to love everyone and everything. So even by trying, trying to, because obviously it's impossible, but trying to love the whole human society, that loving propensity will not be fulfilled on account of imperfections. The loving propensity can only be fulfilled or satisfied fully when it's reposed in Lord Krishna. So Prabhupada said, this is the sum and substance of the Krishna consciousness movement. Prema Pramato Mahan. This human form of life is meant to develop love for God. Because in other lives we have also loved. <clears throat> in other lives we've loved our children, we've loved our wives, we have loved our husband, we have loved our nest in the bird's life. In the bee's life, we've loved our cave. There is love. There's no necessity for teaching a bird or a beast how to love their children. It's not necessary because it's natural to love your home, to love your country, to love your husband, to love your children, to love your wife, and so on. All of this love is more or less also there in the animal kingdom. But that sort of love brings no ultimate happiness, no lasting happiness. Prabhupada said, you will be frustrated because this body is temporary. Therefore, all these loving feelings, these loving affairs, they are also temporary. They are not pure. So they are simply a perverted reflection of the pure love that is existing between the living entity and Lord Krishna. But real love is there in friendship between Krishna <coughs> and his cowherd boys. So the real love is there between Krishna and the cows and the calves. The real love is there between Krishna, the trees, the flower, and the water. In the spiritual world, everything is love. So this, this natural propensity for desiring love, for seeking love, is properly utilized, then we'll understand 
that within this material world there is no love. That we're merely being temporarily satisfied and then ultimately frustrated by the reflection of the real love coming from the spiritual world. So then we have to utilize the opportunity of this human form of life to understand Krishna. And this is Krishna consciousness to understand Krishna. In the Bhagavad Gita, in the fourth chapter, it is said that Janma karma yam yo ahidam yo you should understand Krishna in truth, not superficially. Learn the science of Krishna. This is the instruction. So you should try to love Krishna. And then Prabhupada lines, he outlines the process of loving Krishna. The process is that you worship the deity, you take prasadam, you chant Krishna's holy names, and you follow the instruction of the spiritual master. And in this way, you'll learn how to love Krishna. And then your life will be successful. And Prabhupada again says, this is the Krishna consciousness movement. So our love and our affection, they're actually meant for Krishna. But unfortunately, out of stubbornness, we try to squeeze some love out of relationships that are not directly connected with Krishna. And the result? Frustration. <laughs> so the simple solution Surrender to Krishna, love Krishna, love Krishna's devotees, and be happy forever. So, again, Prabhupada said, out of ignorance, we, ignorance, we stubbornly try to squeeze happiness and love out of these temporary relationships. In one, um, one conversation I was hearing him and Prabhupada, Prabhupada said this dog-like stubborn, stubbornness is simply keeping you here to the material world. Just like, you know, around the, the dog there's a collar with a leash. So the, you know, and the dog is pulling and the master is pulling and, you know. So the same stubborn manner, we have that leash, we have this collar around our neck with a leash. In one hand is Maya pulling at us, pulling at us, and we're just, you know, dancing with her. And Krishna is over here with his flute, and we're just dog-like stubbornness, avoiding. <laughs> so, it's not that there's an absence of love and, ex and expressions of affection in Krishna consciousness. In fact, Krishna consciousness is abundant with love and affection. By the very nature, bhakti, is the expression of love of God, the very premise of our daily life. So, the story of Krishna and the fruit vendor is a nice, it was one example of love and affection in dealings with Krishna. When Krishna was going to the fruit vendor very hastily, he had his little hands full of grains. And because he was, you know, a child, his hands were small and chubby and not so coordinated. So as he was rushing toward the fruit vendor, all the grains were coming out of his hands in between the fingers. And when he got there, there wasn't hardly anything, but he, he was offering, here, you take. And the fruit vendor was so overcome with affection that she, out of the same affection, she began filling Krishna's hands with fruits. And as she was putting the fruits in Krishna's hand, her basket, her fruit basket, was becoming immediately filled with valuable gems and jewels. So Krishna is so kind that if anyone offers him a leaf, a fruit, a flower, or some water, he will immediately accept it if it's offered with love and devotion. That is the only condition that things should be offered with bhakti, yome bhakti aprayasati. The fruit vendor belonged to the poor aborigine class, yet she dealt with Krishna with such great affection. She was saying, Krishna, you've come to, t you've come to me to take some fruits in exchange for grains, but all the grains have fallen out. Still, you just take, take, take whatever you like. And then she just filled his hands with whatever fruits he could carry. 
And then Krishna, in the returning the affection, filled her whole basket with jewels of gold. Had she been thinking, if I give Krishna these fruits, I'll get some gold and jewels, it, the whole thing wouldn't have happened. But because that spontaneous affection was there without any thought of return other than simply pleasing this charming Krishna, this charming cowherd boy, everything was coming. So Prabhupada explains from this incident, one should learn that anything offered to Krishna with love and affection will be reciprocated by with, from Krishna many millions of times over. Just like we're often told, if you take one step towards Krishna, he'll take a hundred steps towards you, etc. So the basic principle involved is an exchange of love, this affection. So therefore, Krishna is teaching us in the Bhagavad Gita that all that you do, all that you eat, all that you offer and give away, as well as all austerities that you may perform, all should be done as an offering unto me. So there's another example of service um, that's service in affection that's in the Shaitanya Shaitamitra in the, the Madhya Lila. And in the purport, Srila Prabhupada states, Lord Krishna, Lord Krishna's mercy is dependent only on affection. So being obliged only by affection, Krishna acts very independently. So Lord Krishna, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, is very merciful. Um, but... His mercy does not depend on mundane rules and regulations. You know, we may be following very carefully so many rules, regulations, so many vrats, etc. But one can only serve Krishna. The service to Krishna can be rendered in two ways. That is through affection or in veneration. But Krishna is dependent only on affection and nothing else. So when service is rendered in affection, then this is the Lord's mercy. One is eligible to receive the Lord's mercy. But when the service is offered in veneration, then this is, Prabhupada says, it's doubtful whether Krishna's mercy is actually involved. Because there's a, when one is doing something out of duty, you may do your duty, but without any, any affection towards the object of your duty, then there's no reciprocation. So by offering service in affection, one becomes eligible for Krishna's mercy. Now then in the um, ninth chapter of the, of the tenth canto, there's a wonderful description of Mother Yasoda. So dressed in yellow, saffron yellow sari, with a belt tied around her full hips, Mother Yasoda pulled on the turning rope, laboring considerably, her bangles and earrings moving and vibrating her whole body. Because of her intense love for her child, her breasts were wet with milk. Her face, with its very beautiful eyebrows, was wet with perspiration, and malati flowers were falling from her hair. So then, in the purport, Srila Prabhupada is expressing that, is actually instructing, it's an instruction, that anyone who desires to be Krishna conscious in motherly affection or parental affection should contemplate the bodily features of Mother Yasoda. It's not that one should desire to be like Yasoda. This is an interesting point here. We don't want to be like Yasoda because that would be Mayavada. In other words, you want, you want to be Yasoda. So either in parental affection or conjugal love, friendship or servitorship in any way, we must follow in the footsteps of the inhabitants of Vrindavan, not try to become like them. So therefore, this description is provided here Advanced devotees, therefore, must cherish this description, always thinking of Mother Yasoda's features, how she was dressed, how she was working, and the perspiration 
of the beautiful flowers, how they were arranged in her hair and so forth. And one should take full advantage of this full description by thinking of Mother Yasoda in maternal affection for Krishna. So here we can get some indication of the nature of spiritual affection and how to achieve it. In the material world, the affection, the feeling of affection can be equally replaced by a feeling of indifference and even hatred. But in the spiritual world, this affection is an ever-increasing situation. So we want to develop that affection, the real affection, the authentic affection, the spiritual affection. And here's a very clear example. Sometimes we're thinking, okay, but how do I do this? So then Prabhupada is given this wonderful purport, how we can actually develop our maternal affection. So in, also in the um, Srimad Bhagavatam, in the first Canto 8 chapter, it's in the purport, um, verse 42, it's um, displayed, explained how perfection of pure devotional service is attained when all attention is diverted toward the transcendental loving service of the Supreme Lord. In other words, whatever activity we're doing, if it is not being directed toward the satisfaction and the pleasure of the Supreme Lord becomes a diversion. So then it's explained to cut off the tie of all other affection does not mean negation of the finer elements like affection for someone else. This is not possible, Prabhupada says. A living being, whoever he may be, must have feelings of affection for others because this is a symptom of life. So, on one hand, I will be ex explaining how there is that um, sentiment of cutting the ties of affection that was, ex that was um, expressed by Shumati Kuti Devi. And at the same time, these, these affectionate feelings, they're a symptom of life. So then Prabhupada explains the symptom of life, such as desire and anger, hankerings, feelings of separation, etc., they cannot be annihilated. Um, this, this type of affection, when aimed towards, um, when aimed, aimed towards, when aimed towards materially motivated um, desires, then this produces the result of bondage. But when the same affection is applied towards Krishna, then this is, reduces one's attachment on the material side and increases the attachment on the spiritual side, and then this becomes a cause for freedom. So um, the so-called affection for family, society, etc., consists of different phases of sense gratification. And when that desire is changed for the satisfaction of the Lord, then it is called devotional service. The same propensity, the same loving energy redirected. Just like we have the typical example of the um, socket in the wall. You plug in one object and you'll get heat you plug in another object and you will be cooled off. So we, take, we redirect this propensity that is there, it is natural in all, all um, species, redirect it towards Krishna, and then it's called devotional service, and that is the cause of liberation. And this is the difference between us and the animals, because the animals, they don't have that ability to redirect their loving propensity. They are simply cut up in their, their material life situation according to whatever body they've received. So Vairagya Vidya, it not only means to give up the affection of this material world, material affection, give it up, but it also means to increase your affection for Krishna. 
So it's not that we're just giving up the affection for the material world and becoming zero. Prabhupada says, no, this zero is the Brahma Bhutta stage. I have no more affection for material things. But the actual stage then is to have that material affection expanded into spiritual affection. So that is our nature, this Ananda Vashat. We want Ananda. Even the animals are seeking affection. Just like there is that nice story where Srila Prabhupada was um, I think somewhere in, in Los Angeles and a little kitten came and the devotees were kind of shocked this little kitten came up and he was rubbing on Srila Prabhupada's foot. And um, Srila Prabhupada commented, you know, how these feelings of affection are natural even in the cat. So even we have um, nice examples of affectionate dealings. Um, Lord Chaitanya had his affectionate dealings, affectionate dealings with animals, so Lord Chaitanya had his affectionate dealings with the puppy dog. But his affectionate dealings with the puppy dog liberated the puppy dog. <laughs> and um, Shivananda Sen had his affectionate dealings with the little dog during their yatra. In fact, he was so disturbed. At one point, he had to stay behind to take care of some business. The boatman was refusing to take the dog across, and he had to just, you know, convince him and pay him extra money. And he had been feeding this dog daily, remnants of prasadam. So now he got detained, and all the devotees went on, and he lost track of the dog. And he was very unhappy about this. And he was looking, where is this dog? Where is this dog? He, he came late on the scene. He was tired. He was hungry. But he wasn't thinking about himself. Where is this dog? Where is this dog? And then he came upon the dog. And the dog was with Lord Chaitanya. So, and fully, you know, in a fully liberated condition. So if we can um, have the same effect, then attachment, you know, to an animal would not be detrimental but we know very well how, um, as one is thinking at the time of death, one gets a type of body. So, you know, by becoming too attached, too absorbed in these temporary affectionate dealings, we run the risk of ourselves entering into a similar body. Just like the classic example Maharaj Bharat, who was actually a very, very advanced devotee, um, a great aesthetic, Remember, you know, came upon the little deer, saved the little deer, began thinking of the little deer. How can this little deer possibly survive without me? So his meditation be interrupted. Oh, my dear, do you need something? And da da da. And then, you know, at the time of death, Maharaj Bharat became a deer. So of course his circumstance was quite um, extraordinary because he became a deer with full recollection of his previous life and he knew exactly why he became a deer and he was given the opportunity to finish things up completely in the next life. But this affection for love and is this, uh, the desire for love and affection is natural. Our natural um, Affects. It is a natural condition. The father's affection is there. The mother's affection is there. The children's affection is there. So the mother or the father, they never forget their affection. But sometimes the child, through bad association, will forget. Um, and so, but Krishna, he never forgets us. We have forgotten, but Krishna never forgets. I had, um, I've told this before, a practical example how one of my God's sisters in her advanced age, she developed this dementia. So it seemed like her condition was really pitiful. She had been a very intimate servant of Radha Vrindavan Chandra for almost two decades. She was her personal seamstress and she was constantly meditating on their form and constantly engaging her fingers in sewing exquisite dresses for the Lord. The other day when I left New Vrindavan, they were wearing one of the dresses that Adara had sewn for them. Adara's been gone from the world for 
almost, I can't even remember, she left her body years and years ago. And before that, she became blind in her eyes, so she couldn't see. She'd sit there in front of the sewing machine. She couldn't see anything, but she would sit there with tears coming out of her eyes, meditating on Radha and Chandra, and lamenting that she could no longer sew for them. So she wasn't totally blind, but the blindness was she couldn't see that, that sufficiently to sew. And then the dementia hit. So then she wouldn't even really appear to know who she was. She wouldn't appear to know her own son. She'd look at her son, who obviously your children grow up, so now he's a grown man. And she'd say, you're not my son. My son is a beautiful little boy. You're not my son. You're a fat old man. You know. And uh, it, it was seeming like really sad to see her in that condition. And one day, well, it was very interesting because her son had to work to support her. So he put her, for her protection, he had to put her into an adult care home. Because if he left her at home, sometimes she would get out and she would wa start wandering on the streets and on a motorway. So sometimes the police would find her wandering on the motorway and they'd say, you know, pick her up. What is your name? What is it? And she would only say, Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna, Hare Krishna, whatever they said to her. So they would bring her to the temple and then I would call her son and say, Deet, you know, Hadar is here at the temple. <laughs> so she had stopped speaking in English. Her native language had been Spanish and she had stopped speaking English but one day she had been brought to the temple by the police who found her on the motorway and she was taking darshan of the deities. And you know, sometimes we take darshan in a very superficial way. We just, you know, we have a look, you walk out and if somebody says, well, what, what color was the outfit? I don't know, you know. Well, what was the garden like? I don't know, <laughs> you know. But she was looking very deeply at the deities and just, it was very intense and I was standing and I was watching, observing this and she suddenly turned to me and she, with her finger and she goes, you may try to forget Krishna but he will never forget you. So then that was it, looking back to the deities. At that moment though I realized because of her full absorption in Krishna consciousness, even though her external so-called life externally was a mess. She couldn't remember her own name. She didn't know her son. She, you know, appeared completely bewildered, bewildered and confused that she was completely fixed in Krishna consciousness. That she was remembering Krishna and seeing Krishna very clearly. So much so that she instructed me that very correctly that I